Um, so my name is Vanessa Fairhurst and I am Community Engagement Manager at Crossref and I am joined today by Amanda Bartel who's our Head of Many Bear Experience at Crossref and Cameron Nalon who is Professor of Research Communications for the Centre of Culture and Technology at Curtin University. Um, if you would all like to say hello in the chat, I know a couple of you are already, uh, tell us where you're joining from, that would be great. Um, it's very early for us in, in the morning in the UK here, um, but good afternoon and good evening for um, wherever you are joining from. Um, and we'll get started telling you a little bit about some of the um, some of the, the basics of the, how Zoom works today. So we're sorry that our presentation today is only available in English. Um, I know that some people are joining whose first language is not English. Um, if you wish to turn on the closed captioning to help, um, you can do so by clicking the bottom of your screen, which says live transcript. I will just make sure that I've enabled that now. Uh, yep, yeah, so you should be able to see that. And then you can click on view full transcript um, to be able to see um, it written across the bottom of your screen. Uh, everyone is on mute. Um, so feel free to uh, chat in the chat box. But if you do have any questions, please put these into the Q&A box. It's much easier for both of us and for you uh, to see the questions that way. We will also have some time to answer some questions at the end. So the recording, the slides and the Q&A transcripts will all be shared afterwards, um, along with a link to a short form, which will generate a certificate of attendance uh, for anyone who needs one. And this will be sent to you via email afterwards. So our agenda today. So today we'll be tackling the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, which is also known as POSI, and why they are needed. Amanda will then talk to us about why POSI will help Crossref to realise the research nexus. And then I will be talking about open metadata and infrastructure services. And then we'll end with a Q&A. The webinar in total should last 45 minutes. Uh, do feel free to write questions in the Q&A box at any point in time and we'll either answer it there or we'll save your questions and answer them at the end. And I'm now going to pass over to Cameron, who's going to talk to us about what are the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Hi, so um, I'm coming to you from um, Curtin University in Western Australia, so I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm standing here on uh, Wajak Nala lands and to acknowledge their elders past, present and future and their continuing connection with this unceded um, and expropriated land. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about what are the principles um, of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, and so as a starting point, we could say there are a set of principles describing design, governance, relations, financial sustainability, openness of infrastructure organisations and how they should work in scholarly communication space. Is anyone still awake <laughs> at this point? <laughs> Um, did anyone actually get to the point <laughs> of um, realising that I put filler text at the end of that? Um, infrastructure is not generally regarded as the most exciting thing for anyone to talk about at the best of times. Um, governance is an area which is difficult and complex and often frustrating to work in. It's not usually regarded as exciting. Sustainability and finances, these are not the things that necessarily get us excited about the capabilities of technology or the movement of knowledge or of innovation. Um, so why would we care? Um, why would anyone want to talk about principles um, of openness for scholarly infrastructure? So I wanted to start by trying to illustrate to you why this is important. Um, and to do this by, by posing a question to you. Um, can you remember what you were doing in 2015, what was happening around you? And, and then start to think about how some of those things are connected. As I put together the slides for this talk, I realised as I was going to talk about what I had been doing in 2015, that I actually had the order of everything completely wrong. Um, and that um, my memory was not reliable. Um, and so when we're talking about scholarly communications, scholarly communications is a memory infrastructure. It is something that uh, we use to allow us to trust more fully 
the records and substance and content of the scholarly record. Um, and that's the reason why it's important to be able to trust it. So one of the things I was doing in 2015, um, and in fact, this started in late 2014, was to write this set of principles, principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, more recently, uh, which has been abbreviated to POSI. Um, and I guess one of the reasons for, for doing this, well, one of the written ways to explain to you why we think it was important um, is to give you a little bit of context about what was happening in 2015. So 2015 and 2014, um, it was a time when ORCID, um, the research contributor ID, um, infrastructure and organisation was starting to, to find its place. It was trying to develop trust with publishers, with scholars, with libraries and with national organisations. And myself and Jeffrey Builder, um, who's now CTO at Crossref, and Jennifer Lin, who is currently the project um, manager for Meta at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we're thinking about another infrastructure, another thing that we thought was needed. And we would just been through this process of trying to persuade people that ORCID was going to work, that it was trustworthy. There was a whole community of us advocating for it at the time. And if I'm honest, we were exhausted. And we got to the end of this process of thinking about this new thing, um, which we hoped to be able to build and realizing that we never wanted to do that again. Um, that we wanted to, if we were going to create a new organisation or create a new system, um, for it to be the last place, for it to be trusted enough um, to be something that would work. So what would it take um, to not have to create new organisations for us to be able to put these things in, in, in trust and for us to believe and be confident that they would be there for those memory institutions to be things that we can actually forget, that we can trust, that we can forget because we know that the underpinnings and systems there are in place. And our concept of that was that to do that, the organisational form for these infrastructures had to be trustworthy. And this notion of trustworthiness is, is actually Jeffrey's point. He makes the point quite strongly that you can't engineer or build for trust. You earn trust over time and it's something that you can very easily lose. But what you can do as part of your planning to earn trust is to be trustworthy. And that involves signaling outwards um, in terms of how you are going to act, how you plan to act, how transparent you are um, and how you operate. And it involves action on the ground in how you actually do things um, and interact with the communities you're serving. So as we thought about it, and as we thought about it in the context of organisations like Crossref, like Orchid, um, like publishers, like libraries, um, but also like other technology providers, we thought through this process and, and felt that there were really three layers or three kind elements of trust that were important um, for organisations, for signalling and for being able to know that we would be able trust them. So at the kind of the most obvious level, um, one of these is, is community governance and sustainability. Something is trustworthy if the community that relies on it knows that it has a stake in its governance and management and that it knows it will still be there in a few years time because there's no point having something that you really like and investing your time and effort in embedding it in your systems and using it in your day-to-day -day work if it disappears after two or three years. The second level, which is perhaps a little bit more unusual to think about, was to embed um, signals in the system. Um, so a community might start off, or an organisation, a community might start off trusting an organisation, but we know of name names, organisations that have drifted away from their communities, that have perhaps not maintained their strong focus on their original mission, or have simply diverged and, and needed to go in different directions. 
And so this idea of embedding in the processes of an organization signals that would, would tell you that something was not exactly as it should be. So some of the obvious examples of this perhaps are that you know, there have been expectation of transparently reporting finances, um, that there would be an expectation that there would be records. And then the danger signal, danger signal is those records or those things are not made available. And so you can go and check and you can check whether this sort of con continued commitment to transparency, to telling everyone that the resources are there to keep the organisation running um, are still there. But there's another layer to this, which is, you know, what happens if an infrastructure organisation does drift away, that does seem to be becoming something that you don't want to trust anymore? And there we focused on look, the ability to actually do something about it, the ability to address problems or issues that arise. And those three layers, the sort of the obvious things around community governance, around sustainability, um, the embedding of this kind of signaling system um, into, into operations, and then the ability to do something were really what um, embedded our, our thinking around the three categories of, of principles. And I'm not going to go through and read all these principles. We can discuss them, and they're available on the POSI website. But if you think about it, um, the three sort of areas that are important here are, are that, that governance? And so we had a set of things we thought were important for the governance of an organisation. Um, the financial sustainability, so again, the trust that it will still be there, that it will continue to operate, that it won't go bust, as so many of the things that we've come to rely on um, have over the last you know, 10 or 20 years. Um, and then this ability to do something if it all goes wrong. So either that the organisation fails financially, and so then open source and open data make it possible for that to be started up again. But even more so, um, if the organisation starts to drift in a different direction, the possibility of splitting and running your own version of this. And this is kind of a, a really interesting point, maybe one we can get to in the Q&A. The point of this isn't that we hope that all of these infrastructure organisations will split and disappear and, and lots of different communities will run their own versions of them, but that in the open source community, the threat of this being possible is enough to get people back to the table to discuss what's needed to move something forward. Um, so we can talk about these things um, and the, the specifics of the principles a little later, and you'll see some examples of that going through. I've talked at a very high level around the, the generalities of why we wrote these principles and some of the things they're intended to do. Um, Amanda and Vanessa will talk more about the specifics of how that operates in, in the context of, of Crossref. But if you remember one thing around this, um, I'd ask you to remember that the object here is for us to be able to identify and build organisations that embody trustworthiness. So you've got two sides to this. One is how do we build things that are worthy of community trust and deserve that role um, and the trust that a label of infrastructure needs, but also as organisations perhaps that are purchasing some of these services and supporting some of these infrastructures, how can you make decisions about which organisations merit your trust and that you consider trustworthy? Um, and so with that is sort of the message that I hope it's now ringing in your ears. Um, I will pass on um, to the next part of the session. Great stuff, thanks Cameron. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how POSI will help us realize the research nexus. And by us, I don't just mean Crossref, I mean the whole community. So let's start with Crossref's uh, goal statement. So we envision a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. So that's fairly high level. Um, how do we actually reach that goal? Well, there's a few key elements to make that happen. 
So firstly, we need open and accessible metadata. And Crossref obviously has a key role to play here, making the metadata provided by our members openly available in a consistent format for both human and machine interfaces. And next, in order to link everything persistently, we'll need persistent identifiers for all activities, inputs and outputs, contributors, interfaces. So that part isn't just about Crossref. We'll need to work closely with other organizations. So ORCID for searcher and identifiers or RAW for um, organization level identifiers. Community awareness and collaboration is also obviously key. Um, and again, this will involve working with a lot of different organizations, I4OC, I4OA, Metadata 2020, et cetera. Um, and finally, a really vital to this picture is our commitment to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, because to meet our goal, Crossref has to be both transparent and trusted. So why did we decide POSI was right for Crossref? Um, well, we know that it's supporting open research. Um, it's key because it enables us to assess and build trust in open scholarly infrastructure and all the services that underpin open research. We know that it's based on real life experiences. So it's inspired by the experience of forming ORCID back in the day of running Crossref and of setting up RAW. And we know it was well received by the community as well. So POSI's already inspired many to evaluate, reference, build upon or extend POSI. And for us, the, the focus on the need for a broader governance was key. Um, existing open infrastructures, metadata and services all need to be trusted and accessible by all parties at all levels of experience and all geographies. Plus, it helps us identify others to collaborate with. So having that set of principles provides a framework for our discussions with other organisations. So it'll enable like minded initiatives to form kind of trusted bonds, share, um, share operations, um, which hopefully means more integrated services for everyone um, and just fostering a lot more collaboration. We also like that it was practical and measurable. Um, so organisations <clears throat> organizations can report on their adherence to the principles and also be held accountable by the community. Um, some of the principles are aspirational and might be difficult for any organisation to meet. Um, and there isn't an expectation that any organisation would immediately be able to reach them all perfectly but they do um, set out a really useful direction of travel. And finally, we like that they were balanced. So it's not a list of things to be cherry picked, but it's kind of a interrelated whole, which helps balance out different concerns and risks. So we'll talk a little bit about Crossref's own uh, path to POSI. So, the Crossref board adopted POSI in November 2020, um, and this blog post from Jeffrey Builder um, at the beginning of December announced it um, and also provided our own self-assessment against those principles that uh, Cameron described earlier. And you might be wondering why it took a whole five years from the original uh, post about POSI back in 2015 before we adopted the principles. Um, after all, they were a lot of them were um, partially based on how Crossref currently operates or the founding principles of ORCID, which Crossref played a big role in creating. So the short answer of why it took so long is that we've changed a lot in the 21 years since we were founded and particularly in the last five years. So people used to see Crossref as a PID provider, a persistent identifier provider. So just issuing numbers like an ISBN, um, or they saw us as just for the benefit of large publishers. Um, and although it is fair to say that when we were first set up, it was 12 large society and commercial publishers trying to solve the problem of reference linking. Um, so it was all about these simple bilateral relationships. 
but we've definitely moved beyond that. Um, we now work with a huge range of different types of members. We've got over 15,000 members in 139 countries, and they're registering a really broad range of content types. And the value of Crossref doesn't come from the DOI, but from the metadata about the content and how the, the links and relationships in that metadata captures what we call the research nexus. So making those connections between authors, funding, funders, research institutions, publications, and other research outputs. So we now consciously operate as a scholarly foundational infrastructure, making all our 126 million records, plus all their connections and relationships, visible and trackable through our open metadata and APIs. Uh, and we collaborate with a wide range of different organizations to make sure we're capturing all of those relationships. So just to capture a couple of the things that have changed for us, um, we've moved beyond our members being what you would think of as kind of traditional publishers. Um, and this is very much reflected in the type of content that's registered with us nowadays. So it includes preprints, for example, and a, a big change is um, grants are now registered with Crossref. Uh, and that means that uh, funders can become members which, is mean, which means our uh, governance has actually needed to change. Um, and we've expanded the type of metadata we collect um, just to make sure we're capturing those links and relationships. So things like corrections, licenses, funding information, ORCID IDs. Um, so, what, so what we're capturing has become more about those relationships. So we're no longer just for the purpose of making bilateral relationships between publishers more efficient. Um, our infrastructure is now uh, helping to manage these kind of multilateral relationships in a network of other identifiers, other metadata and other relationships. So it's a much more complex picture and it's really changed who, how we think of ourselves, what, who we are and what we do. Um, so, and it's important now that we're able to build trust with lots of different types of organizations, funders, research institutions, universities, all of them are now members. It's not just about publishers, traditional publishers. Um, and how we're sustained and where our revenue comes from has changed as the memberships changed. Um, so we've grown from those initial 12 large publishers to over 15,000 members. Um, the typical member nowadays is much smaller. They have just 100 DOIs registered with us. They're probably open access. They're probably hosted on OJS. Um, the fastest growing country for members recently is Indonesia. Um, and this chart shows revenue for Crossref from the different uh, membership tiers with tiers for the largest publishers on the left and tiers for the smallest on the right. Um, and Karen, if you can just click once more, you'll see that what the chart shows is that that kind of chunk of smaller members now provide more uh, revenue for Crossref than the larger. So how we're sustained, and where our revenue comes from has definitely shifted. So speaking of governance, um, we can just look at the board to see how things have changed. So you've got the original board over there on the right and the current board on the left. So it's a much more diverse picture um, with how we're governed. Um, and in fact, after this year's uh, board elections, we're hoping to have a funder on the board as well, which just shows how much things have changed. Um, and another big change is nowadays, all of our members are open access publishers in one way or another, obviously some a lot more than others, but there isn't a member of ours who doesn't support open science and open research. And this really became apparent in 2020 as the pandemic hit and Crossref were undertaking a strategic review, um, which led to a set of motions in our July 2020 uh, board uh, Cameron, if we could click once, 
Fantastic, thank you. And I think the, the key board motion here is the first one where Crossref committed to the collaborative development of uh, open scholarly infrastructure for the benefit of our members and the wider research community. And that's a, that's a really strong signal from the board. Um, and in fact, on the next slide, you can see we've now um, actually uh, integrated working with POSI um, into our strategy. So living up to POSI's become one of our, one of the key elements of our strategic agenda. So how are we living up to POSI in practice? So going through and reviewing and auditing our, ourselves against the principles um, gave us a lot of areas we were happy with and also a lot of areas that we wanted to change. So some of the recent key changes are that review of governance that we talked about. So um, looking at who actually are the key stakeholders for Crossref and um, changing our governance so that we could actually include funders as members and hopefully soon have a funder on the board. We also look really closely at our sustainability. Um, we have a new investment committee to help us prioritise this work. Um, we're hoping to be publishing more about our financing operations. So we want to be more purposeful about making our internal operations transparent. So we've got a new page on our website with our financial information, for example, um, and we're about to publish more about our employment and hiring practices. And we've been trying, we obviously already our data is all um, openly available and we have free open APIs, um, but we've also made available um, some large data files of all of our metadata. So that happened in April 2020 and again at the beginning of this year. Um, and we're carrying on to focus on um, open source. So trying to open source a lot more of our code and also how we do issue tracking. Um, and also our, our support itself for our members is moving into more open forums with the launch of our, our community forum. Um, and again, we're starting to look at how we can work more closely with other open infrastructure organisations. And POSI really helps us work out where are the most effective ways to, to forge that and, and where will be the most sustainable for the future. So those are just a, a few examples of recent changes. And obviously there's more to come as we start living the POSI life. So I'm now going to pass over to Vanessa, who's going to talk us through a few more of our um, open metadata and infrastructure services in a bit more detail. Thanks, Amanda. OK, so so far, Cameron's given us an overview of what POSI is. And Amanda has talked about why POSI is so relevant for, as a crossref and how this will help the community to enable the research nexus. Um, so this is a rich, reusable, open network of relationships containing research organisations, people, things and actions. Um, and as we mentioned before, uh, Crossref is open foundational infrastructure. It's not just about persistent identifiers, it's about metadata, connections and services. And so I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the uses of metadata and how it powers some of our services at Crossref. So we work with over 16,000 member organizations around the world. Um, as Amanda said, this has shifted quite dramatically as to what those organizations look like. A wide range of different uh, organization types, uh, not just publishers, and also many around the world uh, from over 140 countries. Um, and our members supply us with a wide range of metadata that we then make openly available via our um, search tools and our APIs. And in the context of Crossref, metadata is, of course, information about publications that we then make available to others to build tools with, to use services with, and for discoverability purposes. So we have minimal requirements because we need to support a variety of different publish publication practices. And um, basic metadata can include things like titles, authors, dates, um, issue numbers, ISSN, lots of things like this. Um, and we also collect lots of non bibliographic data as well. So this can include things such as reference lists, funding data, ORCID identifiers, license information, clinical trial information, um, abstracts, and importantly, data about relationships between items. Um, so information on 
things such as errata, uh, retractions, updates, and more. This can all be registered through our Crossmark service. And we do ask that our members um, send us as much metadata as possible, and that it be accurate and clean, because the more comprehensive this metadata is, the more connections we can make between objects, the more likely that your content will be discovered and disseminated broadly. So because Crossref's uh, metadata is open, standardized and machine readable, it's very useful for many organizations to help make their content, uh, make that content, sorry, discoverable through tools and services. And here are a few examples of the types of organizations that make use of this. Um, so this includes manuscript tracking systems, scholar sharing networks, annotation tools, library discovery services, and, and lots of different um, organizations as well. And of course, members themselves are obviously able to use our free APIs as well. So the more metadata you include when you register your content, the more data points there are to help your content be discovered. Next slide, please, Cameron. I think we've missed one slide, if we could go back one. Thanks, perfect. Um, so there are several different reasons why someone would search for metadata and many different uses for it. Um, four of the main ones are these. So the more metadata you include about your content, the easier it is for others to search and discover. And this includes researchers and other organizations as we've just seen on the previous slide. Um, reproducibility is also critical. So researchers need to be able to build upon each other's work, verifying and reproducing the results from earlier work. This is helped by metadata links to funding protocols, research data and peer review reports. And this will help to build, uh, create a more complete picture of the work. In addition to using metadata for discovery, it also helps to determine the integrity of the research. So who funded the research? What are the affiliations of the authors? Could there be any conflicts of interest? And finally, reporting and assessment is also carried out by a variety of organizations. So this includes universities and funders um, who need to show accountability and the benefits of public uh, investment provide benchmarking information, demonstrate compliance with funder mandates, and decide what research to fund in future. So including metadata such as affiliation uh, identifiers, such as RAW, um, ORCID identifiers, funding and grant information, license URLs, peer review reports, links to preprints, they all help with this. So now I'm going to have a look at some examples of those uh, four things that I just mentioned. So we'll start off with search and discovery. Um, so at Crossref, our own developers have built uh, metadata tools to help you look up our records um, for when you compile reference lists or to match content to DOIs. And these free tools help you to enter any piece of information about a content item. So you can enter the title, an author, a DOI, an ORCID identifier, and we'll show you what we have in our database. So in the funder search interface, you can enter the name of the funder. So in this example, we have the Wellcome Trust. And we will bring back all the publications that we can see that have that funder associated with them in the metadata. And this is another reason why it's important to provide this information. If you're adding your funder details to your Crossref deposits, then your content will be appearing in these search results. And if not, then it's going to be missed. Um, next slide, please. And in this example, We've done a search um, in the, the uh, metadata search tool for an ORCID identifier. So this is my own ORCID identifier. Um, and then there is various actions um, that someone can take, such as citing, filtering, viewing the metadata in a JSON format. And by logging in with an ORCID author profile, as I have done here, um, I can then see which of these results have been added to my profile. And if there's any that have not been added, such as the one at the bottom there, I can go ahead and do this. ORCID also supports something called auto-update, which is an easier way of doing this. Um, it's central to their mantra of enter once, reuse often. Um, and it's a good example of linkages uh, between different objects. So it saves authors time and increases trust in data by enabling the automatic exchange of information between research systems and ORCID records. So if a researcher gives an organization permission to update their ORCID record. When an article is published that includes their ORCID identifier in the metadata, it will be automatically added to the researcher's ORCID profile. So 
So one of the most important ways to improve research reuse is by linking references. And reference linking means adding DOI links to the reference list of each article or other research object. And this allows researchers to follow a link from the reference list of one article to the other documents that it's citing, helping them to make connections and discover new content. Reference content that also contain references um, and on the next slide we can see an example of what this looks like so here you can see that each of the references has been um, linked to by a doi where there is one available and this means that these links won't break over time and readers will always be able to find the cited content so reference linking is accomplished by members and their production teams with the assistance of authors and editors who add the links to each of their references in the articles so you can ask authors to add uh, the DOIs to their reference list, or you can add this later at the copy editing stage. And we do have a variety of different uh, ways in which you can add references at Crossref, including via um, some of our APIs, uh, which is efficient but requires some skill. And we do have our own lookup tools where you can copy and paste your reference list, and then we'll bring back the DOI matches that we find in our system. OJS also has a plugin to help you match and deposit your references. So looking now at research integrity, and a good example of this is our Crossmark service. Um, so Crossmark is an embedded button for HTML and PDF that when you click, um, when you click it, tells the reader if there have been any changes since the publication. And why is it important to report these changes? So readers need to decide whether they can trust the research. And publishers and journals are the authority on this. It's never bad or negative to update the work. Um, it helps to maintain the scholarly record, and it's an important job that publishers do. So after uh, content is published, it can change, um, and readers need to know this. So this could be an update or a correction, um, or it could be something more serious, such as a retraction. Publishers needed an easy way to communicate those changes, and so our Crossmark service was developed to enable this. Um, you can also choose to include some additional publication information on the um, Crossmark tab. And um, this information stays with the article and can be accessed even away from the publisher site. And machine readable metadata is also available via our API. So if I look at an example of what this would look like in practice, um, this is an example of Crossmark with no updates. So this is what you would see most of the time. It would come up, it would appear in green. If there were corrections, this box would appear in yellow, and if it was a retraction, it would be in red, along with a notice explaining the change. So this document's current, it displays a link to the maintained version, and below you can see some additional publication information that the uh, publisher has chosen to include for their readers. And this can include information such as funding data, license information, ORCID identifiers, authors, clinical trial numbers, and any additional custom metadata that they choose to include. Okay, uh, looking at the last um, example now, this is a uh, one on reporting and assessment. Um, so as part of the European Commission Freya project, DataCite has made use of Crossref's open metadata to contribute to DataCite Commons. And this provides a single search interface for works, people, and organizations. So the people search integrates with the ORCID API and the organization search integrates with the raw API. And this provides a central source for people to find out how research is published, how it's funded, which institutions it comes from, how it's supported by other research outputs such as data. In this example here, um, I'm looking at Curtin University, which is where Cameron is based. Um, and you can really look down into the publications from their researchers by year, by work type, and the type of license it's published under. So there's a wealth of different information here that you can explore to help with reporting and analysis. Okay, so I'm aware we've got five minutes left, so I'll keep, I'll keep this next section brief. Um, so I'm just going to look now about how you can improve your metadata and one of the tools we have to help with this. Um, so I think to note is that people tend to think that Crossref members have a, a defined set of metadata and that our metadata is complete and fully comprehensive. And as much as we'd like that to be the case, it's sadly not. Um, the reality for a lot of our members is that it's more of an incomplete picture. There are some gaps in the metadata that they send to us. 
And this might be that they don't have it. Um, it might be that they can't afford to send to us through their vendors. They don't necessarily recognize the value in sending it, or they simply don't know what it is that they're sending us already. Um, and for this reason, we developed the participation reports tool. And the aim of this tool is to help our members identify areas where they can improve upon the metadata that they send to us, as well as explaining the ways to go about doing so. Um, as we say, rich, richer metadata helps make content more useful and make more connections. So we wanted to provide an easy way for you to assess what you're including in your deposits. So you can take a look at our participation reports tool and you can enter your member name. So this is the name on your Crosshub account and it will come up with something like this. This is your uh, report. So in this example, we have the Australian College of Paramedicine. Um, you'll see the main page of the report and information about the organization. At the top, you can see the name um, and the total number of content items they have registered with us. And it also shows a percentage of items that have certain metadata elements deposited. So these are elements that we consider um, important to make content more useful and easy to discover. So these include references, ORCID identifiers, financial information, URLs for licenses, similarity check URLs, um, abstracts, and crossmark if an organization uses this service. And each has a percentage shown alongside it. If you have multiple titles, each will have its own result. And different titles might have different results because different editors have registered the content. And the same for different content types. So you can select which to view uh, within the report. Each item uh, has a, sorry, each um, metadata item has a, a more information button that when you click it will display an explanation of each indicator with links to more information, including why this is important and how it can be improved. On the right hand side, you can also choose to view the statistics for the current content items published within the last two years, which is the default setting, back file, which is content older than two years or by all time. Um, you can also search for a specific title. So here you can search for a specific journal to look up the report for that. It's good to note as well that not all fields will be pop uh, populated for all titles. If you're looking at content published a long time ago, it's probably not going to have an or ORCID, for example. Um, and some types of publications might not have abstracts or be funded. Um, so you can, you can play around with it and, and have a look at your content. So just to summarize, and if we can go on to the next slide, please, Cameron. Oh, sorry, it's all popped up afterwards. <laughs> um, in summary, um, when you register your mess data, it's very important to remember four things. Um, compatibility, so it will be used downstream. It needs to be well-structured and usable for both humans and machines. And you're not, your mess data needs to be complete, so include as much data as possible. For example, include all the authors, not just the first author and include the ORCID identifiers if available. The metadata must be credible, so this means accurate, so without mistakes or typographical errors. If the metadata is incorrect, it's not of any use to anyone, and it can affect the ease of which your content is discovered and the performance of various other academic services. And make sure that you update your metadata if there are changes. So for example, if the URLs change, it's important you send us the new URL so that your DOI continue to work. And finally, you curate your metadata records over time. So always think about this as a living thing that you can keep enriching. An existing metadata can be updated at any time with no additional cost. So the metadata principles on the previous slide were taken from the Metadata 2020 resources. We've been part of this project from the start and it was recently repositioned as an advocacy campaign building on the outputs of working groups from the last few years and tying metadata quality to the United Nations sustainability goals. So without richer, connected and reusable open metadata, goals such as ending poverty around the world will take longer and zero hunger will re remain just a hope. So you can find out more about Metadata 2020 um, on their website, and you can also sign the pledge to promise to do your bit too. Um, and that's all from us from today. So if you want to read more about POSI, uh, the link is there. Um, you can also check out our support documentation. If you have any questions, you can email us at support at crossref.org. And we also have a community forum where you can post any questions in whatever language and either a member of Crossref staff, one of our ambassadors or another community member will get back to you there. 
Um, so I think we've got, we're about at time, but if anyone has any questions, we can probably take a couple before we close the webinar. Um, I wasn't looking at the chat or anything. Do we have any questions from anyone, uh, Amanda, Cameron? Uh, we had a, a question from uh, Peter, which I just uh, answered um, in the Q&A section, asking um, for metadata interlinking and better discovery are ORCID and Crossref the underlying repositories. Um, so basically the the more identifiers and the more metadata that you can register, the, the better it is for discovery and interlinking. Um, so obviously if you are just registering your content with Crossref, that's great. But if you can also capture things like ORCID IDs, that helps link in the, the authors more effectively. If you can register um, the raw IDs, that helps link in the um, institution or funder IDs to make sure you've linked in the funder or grant IDs to make sure you've you've linked in the specific funding. So, so there's a range of different identifiers that it's that it's worth capturing if you can. Great, thanks. Um, and Melroy has also joined us. Um, so I'm going to allow him to uh, yeah unmute. Um, and I can also if you want to let me go. Oh. Hi everyone. Uh, Manessa, I with regards to Crossref. As I understand, uh, Crossref's also working on DOIs for funders and grants. And mm -hmm. one of the things I wanted to ask was, as and when uh, grants are being uh, given DOIs, if a researcher who is getting the grants has given Crossref permission to auto-update, would the grants be automatically populated into the ORCID record? It's a good question. I'm not actually sure. Amanda, do you know this at all? I don't. That's a really good question. I know the publications auto update, but I don't know if the grant information is included in the publication, whether that also feeds to ORCID. Um, we might have to check that, Melba, and get back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Now, that was just my question because, uh, yeah, I'm not sure as and when the Australian funders choose to go down that route and have their grants uh, get DOIs that are minted by Crossref, mm -hmm. it would be really useful. I mean, they would be in a position to push that directly into researchers' ORCID records, mm -hmm. but just in the event that researchers haven't given them permission or aren't using their ORCID record and they can get it from other ways, mm -hmm. if they've given Crossref permission using the auto-update, it would be good to have it into their record because then when you're looking at research impact and interlinking publications and grant information, it would just make it so much more easier. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Point. I do think in the, in the shorter term, in the longer term, that makes a lot of sense. In the shorter term, I'm fairly sure there is a grant um, updater tool or um, plug in for all good provided by Uber Research. And yes, I would there imagine is one. I would imagine that they would be fairly actively pulling data from Crossref to populate their their data sets um, over time as that as that improves and becomes more populated. So I would expect in the short term um, at least directing people to turn the, the Uber Research one on will, will start to in, increase the diversity of grants. I think you're right, Mel right at the moment. Um, I haven't seen ARC grants um, very effectively flowing through into Walker Records. No, uh, with ARC, I think they're still working on uh, on the uh, the technical aspects of the grant DOIs. At least that's what I've been given to understand. But yeah, I mean, not sure how far that's come along. But fingers crossed that happens. I mean, they're now accepting ORCID, so it should be a matter of time before it starts flowing in the other direction. Thanks. Um, we've got a, a question for Cameron. So if you want to take this uh, live, yeah. Yep. Um, so it's a question from Debbie Flanagan about whether initiatives like SCOS are a pathway for sustainable funding. Um, 
I do, so I think it's really important, um, again, looking into the blog post and the other things that have been written since about the principles, um, the question, we talk about possible models for funding and sustainability, um, and we identify membership as one that has been proven out as working. Um, but what's happened since are initiatives like SCOS and others that create these infrastructure um, support funds. Um, and I think that is a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a legitimate kind of membership sort of model, um, which I think can be a path for sustainable funding, yeah, provided that turns into a, a regular stream of income. The key, the key, the key principle we say is that uh, time-limited funds should not be used for day-to-day -day operational activities. It's fine to use grants and one-off funding to do new development, but you shouldn't be using that for day-to-day -day operations because that's obviously fragile. Um, so how do universities make a case for participating um, in funding such an issue? So in Australia, there's actually really good participation um, in SCOS and support and organisations like AOASG and indeed I think the chair of the SCOS board um, is the Martin Borsch, the librarian at UNSW. So there's, there's good representation there. Um, for those in the libraries um, and in the, on the funding side, if you like, or on the support side, um, I think the case to be made is that these things are, are crucially important um, as part of the infrastructure provision that libraries are making for researchers and the broader user communities, communities using research. For researchers, um, I think it's important for us to make the case and provide the support to um, our supporting libraries um, to talk about how these infrastructure systems reduce the burden for us in uh, recording data and getting that in systems. Um, so, you know, a good example of that, actually the point that Melroy just made, um, if the data from the Australian Research Council is flowing through Crossref into our ORCID records, then our universities will know more and more detail about our grants. They'll get information directly about research outputs connected with those grants. All of that system reduces the requirement for researchers to keep reporting, which means we can spend more time on the research itself rather than filling out forms. Um, so I think you know, for infrastructure, that's a lot of the case. And then the deeper case, like, like I started, um, and you know we've just lived through, well, we are living through, it hasn't been not over yet, a pandemic, which has really tested our information systems, um, both our trust in what, uh, what sources of information uh, we can rely on, um, on the speed at which we can get critical information to the place where it's needed, and systems and institutions and infrastructures that support that and that work well, that have been tested and have in some cases been found wanting and under-resourced, um, can be massively underpinned by this set of infrastructures. And while climate change is a slower crisis in some ways, um, it's one that we're going to have to face up to. And if we learn the lessons from the pandemic about how important these institutions and infrastructures are to responding to crises and to the set of crises that face us, um, then I think that's a really important case to make. Um, yeah, and it's not just about the big crises either. As someone said um, the other day, um, a great example is rare diseases. Rare diseases are not rare. Each one of them is rare, um, but there are many people facing the, the challenges of rare diseases. And again, how do you get information to the right people at the right time in the most rapid way? And that's what these infrastructures at the end are for, kind of discovery and linking um, that Vanessa and Amanda have been talking about. Fantastic, thank you. Well, I think we are over our time, so I would like to thank all of our attendees and also our speakers for staying on for an extra 10 minutes just to answer those valuable questions at the end there. Um, we will be sending out the recording, the slides, the Q&A um, via email, along with a short feedback form, um, and you'll get the link to this as well. Um, if you do have any other questions, you can always email us um, or uh, post those in our community forum. And hopefully we'll see you at a future webinar as well. And um, so thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>